Um, welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Tom Fodden. I'm chair of Grand Rounds. Uh, you receive an email from me every week, which I'm being um, told is wacky. So thank you, Professor Pearson. Um, but hopefully, it interests you enough to get you to come to Grand Rounds. So welcome. Um, remember, you are well. You are here, so you get to see this live. But if you ever miss Grand Rounds because you've got another um, uh, engagement, we do video it. We're videoing it right now, um, and it will the whole thing. Goes, uh, gets uploaded onto the archive. There is a bit of a problem with getting that done at the moment. We're a bit behind times. But if you w do have a fair, some spare time, you can go and look at every Grand Round back to May of 2014. So, um, and there's a whole raft of things there. So if you need some CPD, there is where you can go. Um, th I've been asked to put up this slide, um, which is ab about, presumably, uh, next year's Discovery Awards. So if you've got an, a, a, a research project, you're presenting at a meeting, you, um, uh, and you want some funding to, and help to get there, then why not apply for a Discovery Travel Award? Um, we're currently uh, accepting applications, and you can get up to £300, closing date 1st of December. Okay? DCAT comes and takes over Grand Round twice a year. Once is for the annual lecture, which is in two weeks' time, uh, and uh, is usually well attended because you get free lunch, okay? So tell your friends, in two weeks' time, you get free lunch. We'll fill, the ra be the, fill to the rafters. And the second time they come, which they're doing first, is the Discovery Travel Awards. It's one of my favorite grand rounds of the year. Get to hear multiple presentations by our uh, doctors in training colleagues. And this year, we've got three very interesting and diverse talks. I'm particularly looking forward to the uh, talk that uh, relates the ulna uh, lengths to, to ventilation. That's very, it would be very interesting. But they're all going to be interesting. And I'm going to hand over to my friend and colleague, Professor Ewan Pearson, who will introduce the talks. Thank you, Tom. Yep. So um, just for those of you who aren't familiar with the Discovery Travel Awards, as advertised there, we, we run the scheme two or three times a year. They are competitive, um, so you don't just apply and get the money. We, we go through them and, and select the best. Um, so, um, so as I say, we've run that three times in the last year. Um, the best people got selected and had uh, money provided to support their travel um, and accommodation at meetings. And then once a year we go through the abstracts of everyone who received an award and we choose then the best um, for this presentation. And the idea today is that we're going to hear three presentations with a view to um, deciding who is the DCAT Young Investigator 2016-17. Um, um, there is a £150 cash prize um, for the, the selected um, uh, presenter. We have three esteemed judges at the front who will be uh, scoring the presentations. If at the, after the last presentation, if you all hang around, um, then we will we'll give our judges a whole one or two minutes to decide, and then we will announce the winner um, today. So, um, as I say, we have three presentations, and the order on the list, um, which... Um, I'm sure is, is a random order, is um, starting with Helen Callaby, with, followed by Lim Junwei and Stuart Gaffney. So, with no further uh, hesitation, let's uh, invite Helen Callaby to present, please. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me okay if I stand just here? Uh, so my name's Helen Callaby. I'm one of their FY2 doctors at the moment in Tayside. I got a DCAT award uh, for a project that I've done about surgical termination of pregnancy for fetal anomaly. I actually had a poster of this talk at the British Fetal and Maternal Medical Society's annual conference in Amsterdam earlier this year. It's a project that I started when I was a medical student with BPAS, the British Pregnancy Advisory Service, and ARC Antenatal Results and Choices. And I'm just going to be talking to you today a little bit about the project and what we found. Just so I know what kind of page we were on. Is there anyone that's an obstetrician, gynaecologist in the room at all? Excellent. So, <laughs> to give you a bit more background, because obviously in hospital medicine, general surgery, we don't really come across abortion that much. So I thought I'd just cover the background a bit more than I usually would today. 
So the Abortion Act was brought in in 1967, and it sets out various different grounds, as you'll probably know, under which you can have an abortion. So the most commonly used act is Ground C of the Abortion Act, and I've just put that up here. So that's saying that the pregnancy has not exceeded its 24th week, and that continuing the pregnancy would involve risk greater than if the pregnancy were terminated of injury to the physical or the mental health of the pregnant woman. And within that ground C, about 99.8%, so a very, very high proportion, is for the mental health of the pregnant woman. Slightly more relevant to my project is ground E of the Abortion Act. So ground E of the Abortion Act states that there's substantial risk if the child were born, it would suffer from such physical or mental abnormalities that it would be seriously handicapped, and we refer to that as termination of pregnancy for fetal anomaly, or TOPFA for short, and that's how I'll refer to it throughout. Now, in 2016, there were 190,400 abortions within the UK. Of that, how many do you think were under ground E of the Abortion Act? So either as a number or a percentage, just shout them out. Not bad. So it's actually 2%. So 3,208 were under ground E of the Abortion Act. Um, That Act C that we saw earlier on, that actually covered 97% of all abortions, so nearly all of them. So the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, they recommend that women are given a choice between medical and surgical methods of abortion, and they recommend that this choice is given whenever possible. So if the gestation is taken into account, various safety profiles, these women should be able to decide whether they want medical or surgical methods of termination. There's been research to suggest that women in particular who undergo TOPFA, so termination for fetal anomaly, appreciate a choice in the method that is used. And there's evidence to show that if they're given a choice, and particularly if they get the choice that they wanted, this can actually positively impact on their coping styles and strategies later on. And choice is where women, particularly in England, have been shown um, that they don't feel there is enough choice when it comes to TOPFA care. So if you just ignore the words on the slide for a minute, it'll make sense when it slides in. But in 2016, at 13 weeks gestation, 75% of all abortions were performed surgically. Just for those ground E abortions, how many, what percentage do you think were performed surgically? Just 25%. So, just to make that clear, at 13 weeks gestation or greater, 25% of ground E abortions were performed surgically, as compared to 75% of abortions at the same gestational age. And this is largely down to limited availability of second trimester surgical abortion within the NHS. And that's where BPAS, the British Pregnancy Advisory Service, come into play. BPAS, I don't know if you've heard of them at all. They seem to be more prevalent sort of in England rather than in Scotland. There's actually only one BPAS clinic in Scotland, and that's in Glasgow, so maybe you haven't heard so much about it. But it's an independent sector provider of abortion care, and they have clinics in England, Scotland, and Wales. Even though they're independent sector, they're largely funded by the NHS, so the work is contracted out and it's paid for by the NHS. They provide medical and surgical abortion up to 24 weeks gestation, and they've got a specialism in second trimester surgical abortion, which is what we're focusing on. So just to give you a bit of a grasp of the scale of all the abortions in the UK, BPAS provided a third of them in the last year, and they do about 4,500 surgical procedures each year. So BPAS wanted to create a pathway to look at TOPFA and to see if women were getting enough provision for their surgical choices. So they created a pathway to make sure that they could support TOPFA care during the existing abortion list that they had. So they didn't say, come in on a Monday if you've got fetal anomaly. It was within every abortion that they do every day, perhaps every now and again, one of them would be for fetal anomaly. And they wanted this to complement the NHS TOPFA service that were unable to provide other options. They had a few developers working on the pathway. So there was BPAS, who we've already spoken about, ARC, which is Antenatal Results and Choices, which is a charity who work with women who are making that decision. There were midwives from the NHS, from the Antenatal Screening Programme, and um, obstetricians and gynaecologists as well. 
So they took into account that women who seek top fare have a very different set of emotional needs um, than women who perhaps are choosing to end the pregnancy for non-medical reasons. They wanted to make sure that none of their care needed to be repeated. So quite often, if you go to BPAS for any other reason, you'll have to have another dating scan so that they can work out which method would be best for them. They wanted to make sure that that overlap didn't need to happen and that all the information could be transferred. So that brings us on to the project itself. What exactly did we do? So there was already existing databases within BPAS that I was given access to, and I was given non-identifiable demographic treatment and complications data for women who referred to TOPFA within this time period. So I included all the women who were treated surgically, whether that was vacuum aspiration or dilatation and evacuation, and we excluded all the women who referred but ultimately didn't end up being treated for varying reasons. Those were, that were referred uh, but ended up having a diagnosis of miscarriage. Maternal <coughs> medical conditions as an indication and TOPFAs that ultimately ended up being medically managed. We also got anonymous feedback data from women and partners and this was done by way of a structured questionnaire at the time of treatment. And I used a very technical data analysis programme called Excel. So we had 544 women who were referred along the pathway in that time period. But once the exclusion criteria was taken into play, we actually had 389 women who were treated on the top of the pathway, and this was within the routine surgical lists. The average age was 38 years, and medial, ge medial gestational age was nearly 15 weeks. The method varied, and it tended to vary depending on gestation. So 58% of them were dilatation and evacuations, and 42% of them were vacuum aspirations. Nearly all of them, 99%, were performed under general anaesthetic, and dilatation and evacuation has to be done under general anaesthetic, that's the protocol, but if you have vacuum aspiration, there's an option for conscious sedation, and 1% were under conscious sedation. Now, of our sample, there were no immediate or delayed complications that were reported. So what was the indication for the termination of pregnancy? Chromosomal abnormalities made up the biggest proportion, so 64%, and we can break that down further. 40% of that 64% were for trisomy 21, so for Down syndrome, and 10% were for trisomy 18, which is Edwards syndrome. The other 31% were structural, the most common being central nervous system or cardiac abnormalities, and then 5% were other. Now coming on to the acceptability data and the women's preferences, so we got data from 173 women, which gave us a response rate of 44.5% and 122 partners. Unfortunately, we've got no data on how many women bought a partner or how many partners they bought, so we don't have a response rate for that. Looking at the care that they were given just during treatment, we asked them how they found it and how they thought their care was. 100% of respondents thought that their care was helpful. 100% thought their care was supportive, 100% thought their care was sensitive, and 99% thought their care was knowledgeable. So I'm not quite sure what happened to that 1%. Delving into that a bit deeper now, 92% of respondents thought their partner was included the right amount. And of the responding partners, 98% felt that they also had been included the right amount. Now, of all respondents, women and partners, 96% of them felt that they were provided with enough privacy throughout their visit. And I think this is probably the most important point from our project. All respondents were likely, or very likely, to recommend BPAS to someone needing similar care. So, to conclude the project, we found that accessing surgical TOPFA within an independent abortion service was acceptable to women and partners, and as you can see, we actually had very high satisfaction rates. Most surgical TOPFAs were performed for chromosomal indications, which would not require a post-mortem. So, we showed that 64% were for chromosomal indications, and of that percent, 40% were for trisomy 21, and that wouldn't require a post-mortem. That actually fits with known data, so we know that trisomy 21 is routinely screened for in the NHS screening programme, so it makes sense that that's the most common chromosomal abnormality that we found. We also found that the average age range, or the median age range, was 38 years, which also fits in with the increasing prevalence of chromosomal abnormalities in mothers of increasing maternal age. 
And in the sample that we had, we had no complications reported for TOPFA by vacuum aspiration or dilatation and evacuation. Now that fits in with the known statistics. So in a second trimester surgical termination, there's about a 1% complication rate. Um, we had a small sample size, so it fits that we didn't find any complications. So to summarise, a cross-sector approach to top for service delivery can safely and satisfactorily increase choice of termination methods available to women. There's quite a few references there that I'll just skim over. And then just to thank the women, partners, staff and surgeons that were involved and these people at BPAS who provided the data acquisition. So thanks very much for listening to me talk today. Do you have any questions? Great. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, you could rove. So we have time for maybe two or three minutes of questions. Um, While well, you're all desperate to put your hands up. Um, so can I ask, um, I, I, I was a little unclear why there were so few surgical terminations for this group in the first place. I didn't quite understand why, why they weren't all being offered surgical terminations. Can you just clarify? Yes, yeah, so there's, we know that there's limited availability within the NHS. Why that is, we're not particularly clear on. Whether it's, uh, I'm not totally familiar on the procedures, but whether there's a, it's because of the different skill set needed, so it's a more complicated procedure to have dilatation and evacuation, which is what you need. Whether it's just not offered to women because they come in usually via a different route, they're seen via the screening programme, they're told they have this diagnosis, they've not sought out to go to their GP or to go to, to say that they want a termination. Um, so that's another area of work in itself, really. Okay. Is it, um, is it safer to have a medical termination, avoiding a general anaesthetic and the risks that that in entails, or...? No, the risks show that there's um, of a serious complication in second trimester termination, there's a 1% risk, and the risk is actually much higher of serious complications when you have medical induction. So surgical termination is as safe, if not more safe. Okay, any more questions from the floor? I have another question. So obviously oh, this is a, a questionnaire-based follow-up, but mm -hmm. cynics would say that that your responders are going to give you a positive feedback. So did you yeah. make any attempt to, to, to contact or follow up the non-responders who may be more negative? No, so that's one of the limitations in our study. We've got quite a large set, I don't know if you saw from the sample size, that quite a few women were referred, but a large amount of them ended up not going through with a surgical termination, and we don't have any access to why that was or why they decided not to. Okay, and one last question, great. As an independent provider, is there any evidence that this is pulling money from the NHS services themselves, which could improve that 25% at all? Politically, I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure how that works, whether it actually is more beneficial because they have their own premises, they have more space, they have their own surgeons, whether those surgeons actually work for the NHS and then are taking time out of that to work for BPAS, I'm not sure. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I have, I have one, one last question for you. So you don't know this. Is it your birthday today? Uh, yeah. It's her birthday today. <laughs> is that nice? Not that that should influence the judging, but it is her birthday. Thank Congratulations, you. Helen. Great. Spontaneous okay. round of applause. <laughs> so, um, next we have Lim Jun Wei. Um, is it your birthday today? No, oh, dear. <laughs> Okay, over to you. So I have a quick glance. There's no autopause here. If there is, raise your hand. Nope. Sorry, I'm June. I'm one of the uh, ST1 in North of Scotland. I'm here to present a Birmingham hip resurfacing versus total hip arthroplasty in female patient, the functional outcomes and survivorship. This is the disclosure. So this study is part of the three Birmingham hip resurfacing study that we have done, and. All of them have been presented at local meeting, national presentation, uh, international conferences for both oral and presentation. With this particular study with the Discovery Travel Award, we've been able to present in EFIT and BHS this year. So it's about hip. We have to talk about Sir John Chanley. The first hip is inserted and designed on 1930s, but the result at that time are mainly unsatisfactory and the record seems to be lost due to the war. Between 1940 to 1950, McKee have designed several prototypes of total hip replacement. 
and that time is based on the Thomson cement, metal or metal articulation, and both components fixed with cement. So John Chanley, however, is unconvinced that metal or metal articulation is going to work, and designed the Chanley type head, which have low friction at all. Acrylic, use of acrylic cement and using a high density polyethylene. Since then, the Chanli type hip has been pretty successful in total hip replacement in elderly and inactive patients. They have success rate of 95% in 10 years and more than 85% in 20 years. But what do we do with young and active patients? Because they tend to outlive the implant. The first and traditional approach is often delayed operation. We advise the patient to change their lifestyles, change their job to more, sen more sedentary work, and take analgesia. But eventually, the disabling pain is going to drive the surgeon to do a total hip replacement. And even after the successful total hip replacement, we advise the patient not to return to high impact sport and not to return to manual work to, re to improve the longevity of the implant. Hip resurfacing is another type of arthroplasty that have interesting concept. They have theoretical advantage of restoring the normal anatomy. This is a traditional uncemented total hip replacement, as you can see here, and this is the hip resurfacing. It restores the normal anatomy of ball and socket, minimal bone resection, low risk of dislocation, great range of movement, and when the revision fails, there's a conversion of failed revision hip to a primary total hip replacement. And this theoretical advantage is by using the thin metal shells lubricating uh, at the joint articular surface. But not all hip resurfacing are equally good. The data from National Joint Registry says that the Birmingham hip resurfacing is the best implant that we have. There are concerns being raised about hip resurfacing. People are questioning the claim advantages of hip resurfacing due to the serious complications such as femoral neck fracture, and this giant pseudo tumor that we can see here, which is an adverse reaction to metal ions, and obviously this is at the extreme case. There are also studies that say that small use of small femoral head size and female patients are at risk of revision. So the question is: So what do we do with young active female patients that have arthritic hip? The aim of this study is to compare the outcomes of Birmingham hip resurfacing in female patients to a best possible match to the hip arthroplasty cohort. We retrospectively review all the female patients uh, that all the female patients with Birmingham hip resurfacing to a best possible match total hip arthroplasty cohort in our prospective regional arthroplasty database. On the first part of matching, all patients have been matched exactly on age, gender, diagnosis, year of operation, preoperative high risk score plus minus two points. For those total hip arthroplasty that can't match on the first pass of matching, we list one year at a time. So we still match exactly on diagnosis, relaxing the matching one year at a time for age to plus minus 10 years, one year at a time for year of operation to plus minus three years, and one point at a time to, uh, for preoperative high risk score to plus minus five points. We compare the high risk score, which is com the component of pain function total score, medical and surgical complications across both cohorts. Medwini test is used for statistical analysis and Kaplan Myers is used for survivorship with revision as the endpoint. We have 199 female Birmingham hip uh, female patients with Birmingham hip resurfacing. We have an exact match of diagnosis, which is predominant osteoarthritis, which is not surprising. Most patients are less than 55 years old. And despite the best efforts of matching, uh, Birmingham hip resurfacing patient is still significantly younger than total hip arthroplasty. But total hip arthroplasty have significantly higher BMI than, the, uh, than Birmingham hip resurfacing. There's no significant difference in the survival years and hospital stay for both cohort. For the Harris shift score for pain, there's no significant difference preoperatively, so it's an exact match. And there's no significant difference or improvement of Harris Hip score in pain for both cohort. For function score, no significant difference preoperatively, but Birmingham hip resurfacing performs significantly better across the year. Same for the total score, no significant difference pre-op, significantly better in Birmingham hip resurfacing throughout the year. Complication, there's no periprosthetic femoral fracture in Birmingham hip that we can see. The incidence of DVT is similar across both cohorts, which is a medical complication. 
In our study, 31 Birmingham hip resurfacing and 5 total hip arthroplasty have been revised, and 14 Birmingham hip res among them, 14 Birmingham hip resurfacing and 4 total hip arthroplasty have been revised within 5 years. The reason of revision is a metal reaction followed by aseptic loosening. Kaplan-Meier survivorship shows that total hip arthroplasty is significantly better than Birmingham hip resurfacing. At five years, we have 98% for total hip and 92.4% for Birmingham hip. But the patient satisfaction are equally high across both cohorts throughout the year. For those that need a revise, we look at them specifically. 21 out of 31 failed Birmingham hip resurfacing patients had marked to disable pain prior to revision. Two of them are still not satisfied with the total hip arthroplasty due to disabling pain. But majority of the failed Birmingham hip resurfacing have marked improvement in all aspects of Harris hip score after the revision. Birmingham hip resurfacing is more technical challenge and there's a long learning curve associated with good clinical outcome. Study have been shown that female type of implant and use of smaller femoral hip size is associated with increased risk of early failure. The causes of early failure in our Birmingham hip resurfacing cohort is consistent with the literature. The survivorship in our Birmingham hip resurfacing cohort is inferior to the published literature, but that's because we only select female patients that is known to have increased risk of revision. There are positive studies out there that this, stu this study particularly published this year look at 1,111 female patients with hip resurfacing and, show and concluded that with careful patient selection, appropriate surgical technique, and post-operative rehabilitation, the success rate of hip resurfacing is as good as total hip and sometimes even better. Recent years, there are publicity on met about metal or metal arthroplasty, and that creates anxiety among general public. Despite having the best track record, which is the Birmingham hip resurfacing, patients themselves might not aware that the negative publicity is not applicable to them. MHRA subsequently also issued an alert in 2015 of saying not to implant hip resurfacing on female patients and those that require smaller hip size, which is less than 46 millimeters. It is possible that surgeons perform revision due to the patient concern rather than there is an actual cause that has been identified. And coupled with the negative publicity, the clinical workload, surgeons tend to have a lower threshold to revise Birmingham hip resurfacing to a primary total hip arthroplasty. For those that have not been revised, the female patient cohort that we have, they are generally satisfied with their operation. With the advantage of preservation of femoral bone, low risk of dislocation, and low risk of femoral neck fractures, it is still a good, possibly superior choice in young female, act, uh, young active female patient. However, it does come with a cause with increased risk of revision. But this might be acceptable for some patients that are keen on resuming into high impact sport. This is Dave Walker that have two bilateral Birmingham hip resurfacing for 12 years and is Olympic and is champion in judo. This should be openly discussed with a patient, and after careful counseling and, pa and patient selection, Birmingham hip resurfacing can still be offered to a female patient, but this is currently not the practice in NHS. It's the issue by the government of not, uh, not implanting Birmingham hip resurfacing to female patients. In conclusion, Birmingham hip resurfacing can give significantly better functional outcomes than total hip arthroplasty, but it does come with a, come with a significantly higher revision rate. Patients that have not been revised have seems to be quite satisfied with their implant. Our study is not to recommend continue doing Birmingham hip resurfacing, but it's rather inject a sense of realism into the debate. Careful patient selection, unbiased critical evalu evaluation, and possibly improvement on the bearing surface and the implant could provide a better outcome for a female active patient in the future. I would like to acknowledge the Tayside Arthroplasty Audit Group who contributed to, to the arthroplasty data and Mr. Christie for Ian uh, for image illustration. A couple of references and any question? Thank you. Okay, questions? I've got a question. Okay. Um, as soon as I've got the microphone. A couple of years ago, one of your colleagues stood it right there. Sarah. For, uh, Sarah, yes, for this, for this, the, this award, uh, presented a really good set, set of data to show that uh, if you stick to one technique, mm -hmm. 
then your complications go down, mm -hmm. which makes him obvious. But there's a lot of range of different mm -hmm. turtle hips to do, and she showed that if, you just, if everyone does the same one, mm -hmm. you get better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Is this just the problem here is that people are just not used to doing it? Is this all learning curve, and actually, if everyone did it the same way, it would be better? The study that presented by Sarah is a total hip atroplasty. This is Birmingham hip resurfacing is technically more difficult to do and the way to implant is different than the traditional total hip replacement, uh, total hip atroplasty insertion with the stem and the acetabulum cup. In Taysa, we have two surgeons that work directly with Mr. McNeen, which is the founder of Birmingham Hip Resurfacing. And we don't, we don't look at uh, surgeon-specific outcome, but Birmingham itself retain all the studies and outcome for all their patients. They have 7,000 over patients and their outcome seems to be good. Very good. <laughs> okay. Questions? So can I ask around the, the groups that you were comparing, which were obviously quite different. The people who get the Birmingham hip replace, resurfacing are quite different from the THA and, and then you're matching was n they weren't matched. They weren't exactly matched. So, but they were quite, you know, so you had a two BMI different mm -hmm. and, and they were younger. Mm -hmm. So what, how do you think that might have impacted on your results and is, was there any way you could have improved on that design? We try to limit, A, if we do exact matching because we, are, we have way more total hip atroplasty mm -hmm. patient because of the nature of the operation, we have less we have 800 Birmingham hip resurfacing, but as the years go on with the publicity with the government and media, the number of female patients have reduced. So we ha unfortunately have to relax our matching criteria to have enough patients for matching for, for statistical analysis. We can't limit it to, because part of the study I was thinking initially, should I just limit it to using ceramic implant, which is known apparently the, the the advantage of that we're saying that it's more for a female, younger patient, not just particular female. But all these new technologies come in subsequently later. So the exact we try to match as best as we can as when it's been done, patient age as close as we can. Did you try a sensitivity analysis? We only took your closely matched group and mm -hmm. didn't include the the more broadly matched group to see. I what didn't your data do that, showed. but I'll, I'll I'll go back and look at this. Okay. Looks like we've got no further questions, so thank, thank you very you. much. You get a certificate for presenting. Oh, thank there you. we go. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, Mr. Gaffney. Dr. Gaffney, sorry. Oh, let me just get you started. Excellent. Great. Um, so, thanks very much. Um, my name is Stuart Gaffney, for those of you that haven't met me. I have a very different presentation style to present to you today, um, and it's entitled The Vitruvian Man in ICU, on the length of ventilation and a trip to Italy. Um, I just wanted to highlight what Dr Pearson said. This is apparently for the DCAT Young Investigator of the Year Award, so it's a rare privilege to be considered young. So, thank you very much. What we'll do, we'll... Um, talk a bit about the background, why we did this, um, we talk about the project itself and mainly talk about the significance from an operational point of view down in Glasgow. This is the Travel Award Symposium, so I thought I would you know, um, share a little bit about the travel that I very luckily got to do with regards to this, so it's the first time an audience will ever be happy to see someone's holiday pictures, mainly because it means they'll stop talking about ventilators. Um, and then at the end, for any students in the audience, I'll give a bit of a motivational speech to finish with something a bit different. So this is the first slide of what I presented at uh, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine uh, annual conference in Milan. Um, it's work that I did when I worked in Glasgow in the intensive care unit, so please don't hold it against me. And it all stems from this. So it's related to ARDS. So ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, um, is something that you only really see in two wards in the hospital, one of them being ICU and the other one being Ward 13. It really is that bad, and it's a bad uh, complication or uh, result of any sort of critical illness that you can imagine. Sepsis, polytrauma, pancreatitis, man flu, anything that makes you really, really sick can give you ARDS. And this study from the year 2000 um, by the ARDSnet group showed that if you ventilate these people with low tidal volumes, um, then 
compared with compared with higher tidal volumes, obviously, then almost every measurable aspect of quality that you can think of in an ICU is improved. So mortality, morbidity, days on the ventilator, days in ICU, almost everything gets better. Now, if we can all think back to our respiratory physiology lectures, um, the tidal volume is the squiggly bit in the middle. Um, and if you keep that low, basically you avoid some of the consequences of trying to oxygenate people with really, really stiff, fibrotic, inflamed and non-compliant lungs who also can't perform gas exchange particularly well. Um, the problem is, when you have a critically ill person, be that the post-op laparotomy that these surgeons are very excited about, or the polytrauma, or this poor chap, how do you measure them? So how do you work out what their ideal body weight is when they're lying clapped out in an ICU bed? And one of the ways that we can do that is with the ulnar length. So again, let's go back to our undergraduate days, either anatomy or musculoskeletal. The ulnar length is the difference or the distance between this pokey bit and this pokey bit. It's very, very easy to measure. Um, and based on the patient's age and gender, you can then work out their height or their estimated height. And from that, you can work out what their ideal body weight is. Um, for ICU, for people with ARDS, that means that we can very easily basically multiply that number by six and then you get their tidal volume targets. So it's quite a straightforward thing to do. But unfortunately, we weren't doing it very well in the new Queen Elizabeth University Hospital ICU. So this was the basis of our project. We wanted to work out whether or not ulnar length was a sensible, easy thing to do for our cohort of patients. Um, because we weren't very good at it. And some other uh, centres, such as Glasgow Royal, use a calibrated tape in order to do that. So we wanted to try something very differently. So basically, we took 16 level 2 patients who were able to consent and four healthy volunteers. We measured them. We measured their ulnar length, and we got a consultant intensivist to estimate what their height was. We then converted that into ideal body weight, simulated the effects on lung protective ventilation, and used very clever statistical analysis that I won't even pretend to understand in order to get our results. And what we found was basically measuring height in people who are critically ill is quite tricky. Um, ulnar length is quite easy to do and relatively accurate, and it's evidence-based as well. Um, and guesswork's not that great. Um, and ulnar length is a very easy thing to do in order to offer a standardised, reproducible aspect of care in an ICU where we are quite pernickety about our numbers. Um, and also you can sort of um, apply this to other um, areas of medicine as well. You know, not every urinary tract infection is fixed with cranberry juice and we would quite like to not wreck people's ears and kidneys. So gentamicin often uses ideal body weight and vancomycin as well. So um, you know, maybe it can be applied to different um, parts of the hospital. So what was the point? You're probably asking yourselves what was the point in coming and listening to this chap talk to me. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is one of the newest hospitals in Scotland. It's the, one of the largest critical care facilities in Europe, and it's the result of an amalgamation of three different units, essentially district general units from Glasgow. So the southern, the Victoria, and the western. And as you can imagine, when three different groups of consultants come together, none of them could agree on anything. So they had to start again when making their standard operating procedures and their guidelines. And basically, they had to start from afresh with all of their clinical governance. And I was very lucky to be able to ride on the crest of that wave. You can see where on like now fits in with some of their guidelines. So this is the up-to-date severe acute respiratory failure guideline from the Queen Elizabeth Hospital itself. And in the... Um, box on the top left, you can see that 6 mils per kilo ideal body weight is quite a central part to that. And in fact, every patient who is admitted to ICU in, Gla in the Queen Elizabeth in Glasgow now has their ulnar length measured and they are ventilated to lung protective settings until a clinical decision is made otherwise. And this is the ultimate result of this research, which has really given the, a sort of a cornerstone in order to try and go on and improve what they've been doing. So this is their own QI work that one of the consultants that I used to work with very kindly sent me. Um, and this is related to whether or not they're able to provide lung protective ventilation. And you can see on the far left that they started using ulnar length and over the next 24-week um, period, they've managed to improve their compliance with that evidence-based intervention for people who are on the ventilator. And that's all patients, not just 
pa patients with ARDS. Um, so that was the project. Um, I just wanted to finish by talking about the travel that I got to do. Um, I managed to go to Italy, to Milan, um, and we were able to bolt on some annual leave at the end of it. So first stop was Milan. Milan has two cathedrals. This is the Duomo and this is the San Siro. Um, I will let you guess which one I enjoyed more, but I saw a really good game. And it was 4-3 for Milan, so it was excellent. We then went to Florence. For those of you who haven't been to Florence, Florence is an absolutely stunning city. Um, this is a picture that we took just before my other half ruined her life by saying yes. So it's a, a you know, city that's very close to my heart. Unfortunately, it's now been ruined by swathes of tourists following Dan Brown's latest trash and Tom Hanks, I suppose, as well, although he seems like quite a nice chap. We then finished our holiday by going to Venice. Can anyone work out what these guys are doing? Yeah, so this is, these are Venetian policemen. And this is a speed camera. So much like the people that we look after in an ICU, Venice is falling to bits. And they've imposed a five mile an hour speed limit in the city for the boats. So this is the world's most boring speed trip. And yet, ironically, it's the most interesting picture I took of Venice. I really didn't like it that much. But of course, the, the most exciting part for me was right at the start when I went to Milan. This is the Milan International Conference Center where I was able to present some of this work at ESICM uh, Lives Congress in 2016 and I presented at this little poster booth so I gave a very short PowerPoint presentation to a group of people who were not particularly interested in what I had to say and couldn't understand my accent. I wanted to finish with something a bit different in order to you know, speak to sort of some of the students or those of us who are younger than me in either clinical or absolute terms um, and also to try and sort of advertise the DCAT to thank them for their very generous Grant, this is the conference I went to. I used to think that the international conference was the realm of the professor and high-end research. Um, it may well be, but 15% of 1,400 abstracts were rejected. Um, but seeing as this is motivational speech, 85% were accepted. So you've got a reasonable chance, if you've got some good work, of getting into some of these uh, international conferences, particularly if you're a student. And the students for Dundee should really think about trying to get their fourth year projects in because that's just a gold mine of stuff that you could potentially get into a conference. Um, once you get beyond FY2, you do have access to a study leave budget. Um, international conferences, they can be quite expensive, but there is money available to you. And for the equivalent flights next year to ESICM, you can get flights to Paris for £81. Um, and of course, the DCAT do offer a, a travel award of up to £300, which is why we're all here. Um, they very kindly paid for my outbound flight and some of my accommodation whilst I was at the conference, so I'm incredibly grateful to them for that and also for having me speak. And a final thought, um, international conferences, whilst they are the realm of high-end research, they're not always, and essentially the cheek of me, I went to Italy to tell them about work that they had done about 700 years beforehand. So um, thank you very much for listening, and I would, of course, be delighted to take any questions. Thank you very much. So uh, we have t two or three minutes for questions. Yeah, on the front. Hi, thanks, Stuart. Um, with your low tidal volume strategies, are you recruit re routinely doing recruitment manoeuvres on the patients? Um, as you know, part of it, yes. Plasma. So obviously it's not quite as simple as just ventilating people with six mils per kilo because you know, that's quite a low tidal volume. The, the ARDSnet study did also do lots of clever things regarding uh, PEEP settings, um, inspired oxygen to um, PaO2 ratios and things like that. So for the real sick people in Glasgow, they do do stuff like that. But the main intervention that they've done is to start with everyone at six mils per kilo, regardless of how sick they are and what they're there for. So if it's a, you know, a head injury with an, you know, who's ventilated for that, and they will start at six mils per kilo. Or if it's pancreatitis, they'll start at six mils per kilo. But the, the people with ARDS, they will have the PF ratios altered and the uh, recruitment manoeuvres and this, that and the next thing done. There's possibly an argument for it. Theatre 4, the, our emergency theatre, and we've got that big fancy ventilator now for APRV and things like that, so maybe we, should, maybe we could think about it. I'm not sure what the outcomes would be regarding that. 
Paul? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sorry if I missed it, but first of all, how good is ulnar length at predicting height? And secondly, how did that help with the um, BMI calculation? How does, how does height help with your estimation of weight or BMI? Um, so ulnar length, it, it is, it is evidence-based. Um, and the, the picture that I showed you is from the British Association of Dietitians. Um, so ulnar length is a good predictor of height and um, based on the patient's gender and their age. And from there, you can use the height to work out what the ideal body weight is. So it, it doesn't really matter if you know, it's a standard Dundonian patient of 120 kilograms. Their ideal body weight is probably going to be near 70. So you would still give them um, 70 kilograms worth of, of lung protective ventilation rather than you know, what their actual size is, so to speak. And what did you consider to be ide- ideal? 20, BMI 25, BMI 22.5? what's ideal because you've got their height and you want their ideal weight mm-hmm. you just backwards convert to a BMI well, what's the ideal BMI that's a good question I don't know the answer to that Oof. but I suppose it doesn't matter because what, you, what we're saying is that for a particular patient's height and age and gender their frame will dictate what you know, arbitrarily perhaps has been set as their ideal body weight so that's that, um, that sort of work has been done and that's what they were taking as for the ARNSNET study. Okay, I have another question if I'm allowed. Um, I, uh, Monica and I would like to know if we should be using this in high dependency for our non-invasive ventilation patients. Yeah, yeah she does. We because we, we ventilate it? people uh, with non-invasive ventilation all the time mm-hmm. on the, uh, and we stick them on the settings and off we go. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could be over-ventilating these people What's the title? Should we be using this, do you think, in, as Craig said about theatre, should we be using <clears> this in, in NIV? So I suppose the, the counter-argument to that would be that these, the, the people who have ARDS are ventilated um, on a closed-circuit ventilator with airway pressures that are related to the tube and related to a closed ventilatory circuit, so to speak. Um, so whilst you could use 6 mils per kilo ideal body weight for NIV, you then lose out on the other stuff that you can do um, on a ventilator. PF ratios, recruitment manoeuvres and stuff like that. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I expect probably not. Um, And the other thing as well is that usually when you're doing NIV, you're trying to increase uh, CO2 clearance, and lung protective ventilation does have quite a low minute volume, which wouldn't help in the old crumbly with COPD that you're trying not to send to ICU. Okay, I think we should call it a day. So here's your stuff. Thank you very much. So our um, our judges are now conversing, and we need to give them a minute or two um, to do so. Um, if I can maybe take the opportunity just to to repeat what Tom said at the start, which is around the the DCAT annual lecture next uh, two weeks time. Um, so this really is our flagship. Um, the last few years we've filled the, the lecture theatre um, and it's clearly I think because we provide food I'm sure that's the only reason um, so there will be food um, it's Sarah Tabrizi um, who is probably the world leader on Huntington's disease um, so um, she's a fantastic speaker if you, if you google her you can find all sorts of YouTube videos where she, she does all sorts of public talks and I think she will give um, a brilliant lecture. So spread the word, please, because it would be great to really try and fill the, the lecture theatre again for her talk in two weeks. And have I been talking for long enough? Yes, the judges have come to a decision. So. Okay, so gives me great pleasure to announce this year's annual DCAT Young Investigator Award um, goes to Dr. Helen Callaby. So Helen, please come up. up. I should say that the the cheque will be forthcoming. Um, Just to remind everybody, a £150 cheque and a certificate again. Thank you very much. Well done, well done. So, happy birthday, Helen, and, uh, and uh, 
That is not the solution to winning the prize next year. You don't you have to be, it doesn't have to be a birthday. Next week, uh, Sarah Alstaff is going to come and talk about pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, which is a very interesting topic and very topical, um, and she's a great speaker. She always has lots of interesting, funny things to say, so please come for that. Uh, the following week, DCAT lecture. The week after that, I have no idea. I'm sure it's fantastic. Okay, we'll see you all next week. Thanks very much to all our speakers. Goodbye. <laughs>